Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And in today's episode, we have Dinosaur of the Day, Luso Titan. We're covering the second day of SVP, Thursday. We have a bunch of dinosaur news, and we're also doing a quick review of a card game called The Bone Wars. I bet you can guess what it's about. <laughs> but first, we would like to thank some of our Stegosaurus patrons. Specifically this week, we would like to thank Scotty, Jackson, Megan Dixon, Eric Keller, Kessler, and Beth and Scott Wilson. And Beth and Scott just joined, so thank you guys. Yeah, thanks so much. We really appreciate all of our patrons. And if you're looking for ways to contribute to our podcast, then please check out our page at patreon.com slash I know Dino. And based on our listener survey, we changed our next goal. If you're familiar with Patreon, it's kind of like Kickstarter where you unlock different things when you get to different levels. And at, when we got to $200, we sent everybody a sticker who was a patron. Now when we get to $750, we're going to send everybody a piece of dino art that Sabrina is working on. And it's pretty awesome. It's not done yet. No, but it is inspired by Planet Earth 2, to give you a hint. It's not a, that good of a hint because there's literally a bird in every episode of that show, at least one, but it's related to one of them. Jumping right into the SVP news, which I don't think is old yet. There was just so much news, though, <laughs> and a lot of it was brand new at the conference, so I haven't really seen too many articles yet about these stories. They're trickling out. Yeah, I think a lot of people got overloaded like we did, and it's just <laughs> slowly working its way through. So the first one on Thursday that we found really interesting was by Baborovic, and what he did was he attempted to show some new colors in dinosaurs by looking at something other than just melanosomes. And as a reminder, melanosomes or melanosomes, as it seems like everyone but me says, have five different types. There's black, brown, or red, reddish brown. There's also gray, iridescent, and what's called penguin color, because penguins apparently have their own unique color. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> it's a fun little factoid. There are also two types of structural colors that aren't related to specific melanosomes. There's iridescent feathers, which are created by a keratin base layer, and then melanin reflects different colors depending on the viewing angle. And those are really beautiful. There are also car paints that have this effect. For a, a little while there in like the early 2000s, a lot of people had this color shifting paint that switched between purple and green, I think. There's also yellow and black and a bunch of other colors now. And it's really cool because as it moves by, it looks like a hologram or something. It's really awesome. But birds can do that just with their feathers because birds and dinosaurs are awesome. <laughs> so what he was looking at was non-iridescent structural colors. So the structure doesn't cause that iridescent effect where the color changes, but the structure of the feather isn't produced by a pigment. Instead, it's a melanin base that absorbs all colors. And then there's a structural layer above that that only reflects a certain colors. And it's the same for all angles. So he was looking for the right structure and which colors it would reflect, basically. So after a ton of work and apparently spending over a week in a basement with dead birds. That is dedication. <laughs> yeah. I think he said it as one does. Yeah. <laughs> so he found that a lot of the colors were really similar shapes. So it was really hard to pick out the difference between different colors in these structures. But eventually he decided that this bird called Eocoraceus, I think is how it's pronounced, was probably mostly blue colored with some black spots as well. And I think he said he was about 60% sure, which doesn't sound great. But I guess when you're working with fossils and pretty incomplete records, it's kind of hard to make these distinctions sometimes. So it would be amazing if they could extrapolate this to other dinosaurs. And I think this guy was actually like 40 million years old or so. So it's basically a bird. But if we could go back to, you know, something like a T-Rex and find out what color it was based on these structures, potentially in their scales too, it's hard to say exactly where you can find this kind of thing. That would just be awesome. 
Another presentation that was really interesting was by Heina, and he looked at some fossils in the Netherlands and what were called microbial mats and the disarticulation in marine reptiles that were caused there. But the cool thing about it was these microbial mats can cause what's called a stick and peel problem. <laughs> so basically what happens is you get these fossils that are laid down and you can imagine you have like a fully articulated dinosaur or some other animal and then this microbial mat or a piece of it gets stuck to part of the dinosaur and it gets peeled off Ugh. during the geological process. Well, it's way after the animal's dead, so yeah, it's just the still. skeleton. <laughs> Something about peeling. I guess so. But I mean, it's really like peeling back rock. It's not really just the bones. So the weird thing about it is it causes random gaps in the fossil. So you can have things where like just part of the arm is missing, where the whole shoulder and the rest of the body's there and the hand is still there, but just like the middle of the arm gets peeled off. So I thought that was pretty interesting. I never heard of that before. And I could see how that'd be really problematic. <laughs> yep. Our two favorite presentations of the day were probably both about taphonomy, which is the study of basically how things die and then where their bones end up. So <laughs> the first one was about Madagascar. And Rogers talked about this site, which was actually the site where he discovered that Majungasaurus cannibalism was a thing <laughs> by finding, you know, teeth marks on a Majungasaurus and the only other animal around that was big enough and had the right teeth for it was a different Majungasaurus. And they found these huge multi-taxic, meaning different species, death assemblages that included birds that he kept describing as like falling right out of the sky <laughs> because I guess they looked just like a strange, you know, sudden death kind of posture, as well as fish and turtles and sauropods and then, you know, Majungasaurus. And there was no evidence of hunting or scavenging in these large areas with all these different dead animals. So based on that, he assumes, well, they were probably killed quickly and killed as a group because if one of them died first, you'd expect one of these predators or scavengers to come by and chew on them a little bit. Mm -hmm. And Especially when I think he described the birds as basically dropping dead. So Yeah, so it would be pretty easy prey. And what he thinks happens is that there might have been an algae bloom that was toxic and then it poisoned everything. <laughs> so it's really hard to prove this kind of thing because, you know, the algae obviously isn't there anymore. Or maybe it is. So he's trying to do a chemical analysis to find out if we can find remnants of this poison or of the algae. And another interesting thing was he talked about the death pose that they're in. And you're probably familiar with like how in Jurassic Park, they show the velociraptor in that little scanner when they're looking at it underground. And it's got its neck curved back with its head all the way back by its hips because it's got that, you know, crazy neck curve going on. And it's been debated for a while whether that's a typical death pose that basically happens to every animal in a sort of rigor mortis like effect or if it's caused by the animal kind of suffering and it's like this strife pose that they get into. And he's proposing that it might actually be the latter, that they're really suffering and stretching backwards. They look like they're suffering. It, it does give you that idea when you look at them. Although we talked about a paper earlier where they had those long necked chickens and they autopsied a bunch of them and like killed them and saw how their necks moved. And a lot of them did arch back. But this could support the hypothesis that the death pose is caused by stress if they do find poison in the chemical analysis, because dinosaurs aren't always in that death pose. So it obviously doesn't happen every time. We'll have to see. Just to clarify, the birds dropping dead, what was interesting about it, not necessarily that they're prey or easy for predators to get to, but the fact that they could easily have flown away but then there's a bunch of them that seem to drop dead. I oh, like that was really interesting. That they died really suddenly rather than just like hiding somewhere kind of thing. Yeah. Getting sick slowly. That is interesting. And the other taphonomy talk that we really enjoyed was by Berensmeyer, who was really a treat to see in person. And what she was talking about was how 
whenever we find bones that were obviously transported over a distance, they tend to kind of disregard the ecology of the animal because you assume that, well, it moved, so we don't really know where it started, and therefore, if it's found near other animals, those animals might not be ones that it lived by in life, and it might have just collected somewhere else, basically downstream if, say, they were in a river. So what she and some colleagues did was they tested many bones in a fluvial or river environment to see just how far bones do move when you throw them into a river, basically. And what they found was that generally only the light bones, like ribs, moved any sort of significant distance downstream. And by significant distance, I mean the order of kilometers. They're still not moving really, really far, like miles and miles and miles. It's just a couple kilometers. And the amount that they moved was usually within what would be considered their home range, meaning if you have an animal that lives in the wild, it has a certain range that it tends to walk around looking for food or mates or whatever, and that tends to be on the order of tens of kilometers. So if their ribs only move single-digit kilometers in a river, it's likely that they still end up in their regular ecology anyway. A few other things that she pointed out were that the bones spread out. They didn't concentrate in these experiments. So finding a bunch of bones together that look like they may have moved, it's probably unlikely that they actually did move a significant difference because what you'd expect is the farther they move, the more they get spread out, not some sort of concentration event happening. So if you find a big group of bones, it's likely that they did in fact all kind of die together in that spot. It could unfortunately lead to some sorting, for example, ribs moving away from the rest of the body, so you might find a little collection of ribs somewhere because they got pushed downstream, but you know, you wouldn't see the skull and the hips and everything else showing up with them too, most likely. One of the most interesting things to me was that the bones that washed downstream, even when they went a couple kilometers, didn't appear to break or abrade meaning wearing down, much at all, which is really commonly cited as evidence of transport phenomenon. Usually they say, oh, this bone looks a little bit worn down, and we found it in a marine sediment, and therefore we think it moved really far. But in her tests, it seems like <laughs> if something's worn down, it might make more sense to say that it was worn down by air, if it's exposed in the air for a long time, kind of getting sandblasted or something like that. Unfortunately, when we find bones, they still could end up in a different habitat, especially if they're out to sea via like a bloat and float mechanism, like Borealopelta, which washed out to sea and then eventually sank. And then obviously the fish and things that are around it aren't going to be animals that it was living with while it was alive. But her final point was really that mixing in time is really a much bigger issue than mixing habitats. And by that, what she's talking about is if you think about the layer cake that is paleontology of all the different eras, sometimes different events can happen that kind of stir up the layers of the cake. So you end up pushing something up and it looks like it's a couple million years younger or older than it actually is, and therefore that it's living with something that it actually wasn't. Whereas in these river systems, it's a lot less likely that something's going to end up somewhere where it didn't belong in the first place. So in summary, it might not be a big deal if things move a little bit. Which is different from how we've heard it being talked about in the past. Yeah. Yeah, especially the abrasion thing. I find that really interesting. I'd like to see more studies on this, maybe in like a more vigorous river <laughs> or out in a long distance in the ocean just to see how much bones get worn down in kind of a worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. I think they had a jawbone too and she said they didn't lose any of their teeth and all these little details were still visible too. Yeah, pretty was, interesting. And that was after years, I think. There are also a few interesting posters on Thursday. One of them was about how theropod pelvic musculature changed by roads. And what it really showed is that Animals like dromaeosaurs started using their knees for walking more than earlier theropods, which use their tail to lift their legs. I don't think about this that much in my day-to-day -day life because I don't have a tail. But <laughs> So I assume we basically use our knees for locomotion. You know, you have the quadricep that lifts your leg up and then you walk that way. But dinosaurs actually, when they swing their tail from side to side, have muscles that reach down onto the back of their legs and act as basically our quadricep does to lift the leg, 
which is pretty cool. It'd be kind of fun if we had that going on, <laughs> but we don't. And that transition can tell you something about the way they acted and the way they moved. So it's pretty cool to see that someone's figuring out exactly how to analyze this. And when I was looking at the pictures, I was pretty lost until they explained it because when you look at a dinosaur pelvis, there are all these different muscle attachment points. And since we don't have tails, none of it is intuitive unless you study it to figure out exactly where things are attaching and how that affects the biomechanics of the animal. So pretty cool. There was also a poster that made Sabrina a little bit sad. Not sad, just like, oh, that happened. <laughs> yeah, this one was by Takasaki, and it was looking for how chicks, meaning baby birds, select their gastroliths. And they took 76 chicks with different diets. They basically forced them into four different types of diets, some with more food, some with less food, and then different types of food, and let them pick different stones for their gizzards. And unfortunately, at the end, they had to euthanize all of them so that they could actually get at the gizzards, and they wanted to compare them over a set period of time, too. So as often as the case in science, you had to euthanize a couple animals. But one of the things they were looking at was how having a stronger gizzard or a highly muscular gizzard <laughs> affects the way that the gastroliths look. And what they found was that having a more muscular gizzard led to well-rounded gastroliths and that that tended to be the case in animals that were eating more of an herbivorous diet. So basically what you can extrapolate that to potentially is looking at the gizzard stones or gastroliths that are found near a dinosaur and kind of guess at what it might have been eating based on the shape of them and how smooth they are. And what they propose is that Dinochirus was probably an herbivore instead of an omnivore because it had these well-rounded gastroliths. So that's pretty interesting. We usually hear of Dinochirus being described as an herbivore, but it's good to have more evidence to support that. Yeah, oh, it's such a weird dinosaur. <laughs> it is. So I guess nothing would really be surprising at this point. <laughs> yeah. I usually hear it described as opportunistic, but it did have a large gut, and usually the herbivores had the larger guts. True. And there was also a poster by Ascari about Deinonychus, where they showed that it may have used its claws to climb based on comparisons to living birds, mammals, and reptiles. Whereas we usually think about its claws as being stabby, stab, stab. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to put it scientifically. Climby, climb, climb, then stabby, stab, stab. Yeah, maybe both. Yeah. <laughs> and the last poster we're going to mention from Thursday was by Kerr. And he had this really cool technique for teaching people how to do paleontology. And by do paleontology, I mean excavate bones from rock. Although in this case, they weren't real bones. So what he did was he 3D printed a yellow replica of a fossil quarry, which was scaled down to basically be, you know, desk sized <laughs> so that a whole bunch of students could do it at once. And then he painted the 3D print, which was yellow plastic, black over the top and then buried it in rock and then gave it to students to excavate. So the benefit is when the students were digging it out, if they dig too deep, they knock off some of the paint and reveal some of the yellow plastic. So you can see exactly where they messed up and you can give them tips on, you know, you shouldn't go back to that area and scrape at it so much and things like that. And this way they learn without damaging actual fossils. Yeah, it's really a win-win. It could be really great for training and then Later, we saw another poster where they had an even larger scale version of this for the field where they made cast replicas and buried them out in like a hillside. So it's a really good idea to kind of get people's feet wet testing out stuff like this before they actually dive in and start scraping at real one of a kind fossils. Yeah, it's a good way to implement 3D printing technology. Oh, yeah. I love 3D printers. So... Hopefully we'll be able to interview Kerr later on and hear more about this project. Yep. 
Next, we have some dinosaur news. So first up, the Triceratops skull and other bones found in Thornton, Colorado, which we mentioned in a previous episode, has already gone on display at the Denver Science Museum, which seems really fast to me. But anyway, 12 bones have been found at the Thornton construction site so far. There's brow bones, lower jaw beak, parts of the frill, vertebrae, and ribs. And it's, again, pretty rare to find a full Triceratops in that area. So now some of these fossils are on display and visitors can see them through a window. I'm guessing while scientists work on preparing the bones. Pretty cool. That is cool. In other museum news, the Field Museum in Chicago is changing things up. So first, they're getting a cast of Patagotitan Mayorum, which is the titanosaur that's also in the American Museum of Natural History. Copycats. Well, (laughs) they're doing a twist to it. So what happened is Ken Griffin, who is apparently the richest man in Illinois, worth $8.1 billion, donated $16.5 million to the museum. Very generous. Yeah. And this titanosaur is going to be so tall, visitors on the second floor balcony will be eye to eye with it. And it's going to be a cast. So visitors are going to be able to touch it, unlike at the American Museum of Natural History. Hmm. There's also going to be real fossils, such as an eight-foot-long thigh bone, and the titanosaur will go on display sometime late spring of next year, which is pretty quick. The Field Museum's also using that money to move Sue the T-Rex out of Stanley Field Hall and give her an update and some touch-ups, so she's going to get Gastralia, and she'll be moved to look like she's walking instead of skulking. And then they're going to relocate her to her own gallery, which will tell the story of her life, and it's going to be in a new space about... 5,800 square feet. Awesome. I wonder if they're going to update. I know that I've seen some complaints about where her arms and scapula are Mm -hmm. placed. Mm -hmm. I assume they'll update that when they add the Gastralia also. Probably. There weren't too many details, but they said they're updating to reflect recent research. Okay, that's good. So there's also going to be digital interactives, fossils, and multimedia. And Sue's coming down in February of next year, and then she's going to be unveiled in her new gallery in spring of 2019. It's going to be a good year for dinosaurs. I think that's when the Smithsonian reopens, too. Mm -hmm. The other thing that makes that cool is the Titanosaur in AM&H is in that tiny room. So (laughs) it doesn't really show off its full size in the best way. But putting it in a larger room so it can kind of stretch out a little bit will be nice. (laughs) I guess, yeah. Next, the National Museum of Australia in Canberra is getting a Mutaburosaurus, and the Mutaburosaurus fossils were found in 1963 by Doug Langdon when he was driving cattle, and now a small team has made casts and rebuilt the skeleton. So it's one of the largest dinosaurs found in Australia so far. It's nearly 30 feet or 9 meters long, and Mutaburosaurus weighed 4 tons. It took museum preparators 4 months to build the skeleton. So the internal supporting structure has 300 kilograms of steel and bones made of polyurethane foam. The replica will soon be on display in the main atrium space in the main hall of the National Museum of Australia. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Australia is looking better and better for a dinosaur trip. I know. (laughs) Someday. Thanks to Scotty, who shared this one with us via Twitter, via Thomas Carr. Carthage College in Kenosha, Wisconsin, has a paleontology track. Students enroll as biology majors along with specific paleontology-related courses like comparative anatomy, dinosaur evolution and extinction, and a field course where you dig up dinosaurs with Thomas Carr, as well as an independent study for students who are planning to go to grad school to do research. So if you're thinking uh, as an undergrad that you want to study paleontology, maybe this is a good course. Wisconsin stepping up. Yeah. (laughs) Next, thanks to Chris, who shared this one with us via Twitter. UK retailer John Lewis has taken off the boys and girls labels from clothes and removed the boys and girls sections from stores. And John Lewis has its own brand. And those clothes will now say either girls and boys or boys and girls on the labels. None of the styles of clothes have changed, but the idea is that boys and girls can wear all of their clothes. So they've also launched a unisex clothing line for kids, which has dinosaur print dresses. And there's some controversy around all of this, but I do like that they're designing more dinosaur clothes. And I wish there were more dinosaur clothes for adults other than t-shirts. Yeah, I could go for a dinosaur print suit. Oh, yeah. I didn't even think <laughs> of that. I know you're, you're talking about dresses, probably. Or skirts or pants. Just not ill-fitting t-shirts. <laughs> And last, thanks to Damien, who shared this one with us via Facebook. So you'll soon be able to build your own dinosaur park with the game Jurassic World Evolution by Developer Frontier. In the game, which you'll be able to play on PC, PlayStation 4, and Xbox next summer after Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom comes out. Not a big surprise there. 
you'll run your own park on Isla Nublar and you can build attractions and you can build dinosaurs. And of course, you try to keep your guests safe from your dinosaurs. <laughs> that sounds cool. Those park builder games are pretty fun. Mm -hmm. Although also pretty all consuming yes, in terms of time. Addicting. I'm sure we'll play it. I know you really liked the Jurassic Park Builder iPad game. Mm -hmm. I really liked the game called Dinosaur Tycoon, <laughs> which was very simple. You didn't set up any fences or anything, really. Everything was like a predetermined spot, and the whole park fit on one screen, because I think it was on DOS on like floppy disks or something. But that was pretty awesome. I'll take your word for it. I think I should play that on Twitch. That'd be fun. <laughs> and real quickly, we want to talk about the Bone Wars card game that we got a chance to play. It was made by Zygote Games, apparently back in 2005, according to the box. Yeah, it's been around for a while. Yeah, and if you couldn't guess, it's about the Bone Wars between Othniel Charles Marsh and Edward Drinker Cope back in the late 1800s when they were out west in America trying to find the most dinosaurs and describe them super rapid fire. They did a lot of research for this game. I was impressed. Yeah, they got pretty much everything right. There are a couple of minor things that I have problems with. But. Well, they probably had to keep it general <laughs> to make sure the game was still fun. Yeah. So the whole idea is that, well, it's for two to four players, and there are three phases to the game. You take turns in out in the field, which is when you collect your dinosaur bones and different cards. And then there's a museum phase where you're assembling your dinosaur bones if you can. And then there's a controversy phase where basically you try to mess up everybody else's dinosaur skeletons. Yeah, that one's really fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's definitely the most to do in the controversy phase. And then they have cards that you collect that are either fossils, so things like coprolites, or they call them bones, which is limb bones, vertebrae, and skull bones, and they're different colors, and they're meant to be, I mean, they all add up to actual dinosaurs, but they kind of group them by if they're theropod or... Thyreophora, which is ankylosaurus and stegosaurus, basically. Mm -hmm. And sauropods and seropoda. Yeah, and seropoda, that's one of the things that I think is weird, because it's not really a term that anybody uses. It's, I think this is the first time I encountered the term. I had to look it up. It basically is a combination of ornithopoda and ceratopsians. So when I looked at it, because the first one I got was a ceratopsian, I was like, do they mean ceratopsia? But no, they combined those two for some weird reason. But then they have thyreophora separate. So I don't know what that's about. I think they should have just split them up a little bit more. <laughs> Maybe it got too complicated that way. I suppose. So you're collecting these bone and fossil cards, and you also collect these dinosaur name cards, so like Camarasaurus, for example. And hopefully, by the time you get to the museum phase, you have enough of the right Camarasaurus bones to put it together. And you put it down and you say, this is my dinosaur. And then in the controversy phase, people can say, no, that skull is wrong or something like that. And then the thing with the controversy phase is you can throw down because you're trying to get to a set number of agreed points beforehand. So if you just want to try to grab some points, you can throw down some really crappy dinosaur and just kind of make a last ditch effort that obviously doesn't match because they're color coded. So it could just be like all different colors and everything. But then someone could correct you and then you lose a bunch of points. So there's kind of like this risk reward to putting down dinosaurs that are really well done, but you might get less points for it because you're really careful about which ones you use versus just throwing down a bunch of cards that give you some quick points, which is kind of the fun balancing act of the game. Yeah. And you can play, since it's two to four players, you can play as either Cope, Marsh, Barnum Brown, or Charles Sternberg. And your card has like a little bit of information about each of these men. But what I really like about the game and what makes me think that they did a lot of research is that most of the cards have a quote from an actual paper or newspaper article or something a paleontologist from the 1800s said. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty fun. Yeah, so it was a pretty fun game. We played it with four people and it seemed to work pretty well. I'm not sure how fun it would be with two people it seems like it might be a little bit contentious since there's that controversy phase where you're messing with people's dinosaurs all the time i got contentious with four people a little bit yeah i was happy because i got the ankylosaurus card although i built it mostly out of stegosaurus parts <laughs> yeah you do what you can yeah it was a little hard for me to play because 
I know you can play putting down the wrong parts, but I kept looking at it like, oh, this is really wrong. Yeah. And I could spot it from like across the board. So there would be a theropod and I'd be like, oh, it's got T-Rex arms yeah. or like, oh, that one's got a triceratops head when it's supposed to be a styracosaurus or whatever. So I think that gave us a bit of a disadvantage. We were playing with people who are not as enthusiastic about dinosaurs. I thought it gave me an advantage. Oh. But then again, I ended up winning. Yeah. So, I thought it was, it held me back. <laughs> I didn't want to take too many risks. Maybe it held you back, but it gave me an advantage somehow. That's weird. <laughs> so yeah, it's a fun card game. Yep. Good to do on a rainy day or a, a heat wave day, which is how we played it. Yep. You definitely need a table, though. It's not something you could really play in a car because you have to lay out your quote unquote museum in front of you with all your dinosaurs. So we ended up taking up a fairly decent size of a table to play it. And as we mentioned before, we have updated our Patreon goal. So now when we get to the $750 mark, everybody's going to get some dino art. And I think we'll probably break that down into the higher tiers might get an actual print, whereas the lower tiers might get a smaller thing like a postcard or something like that. We'll have to see as the time comes closer. But if you want to make sure you don't miss out on that, you should join our Patreon if you haven't already. And thank you to everyone who has joined. It helps us to get to SVP and pay for hosting fees and all the stuff that goes on with making a podcast. We also posted an affiliate link for that Bone Wars card game that wasn't an ad. I realized while we were saying it, it sounded a little bit ad-like, but it wasn't. <laughs> but if you go through our Amazon affiliate link in our show notes, we'll get like a couple cents or maybe a dollar or something for everyone that buys one if you're interested in the game if you're not you know don't buy it obviously <laughs> good advice is that is that am i selling it well <laughs> you're a really good salesman <laughs> yeah so if you're interested in joining our patreon please head over to patreon.com slash i know dino and you'll definitely be in line to get our dino art as well as some patron only posts that we put up sometimes like in advance of a review or an interview we'll put up a post letting you know what's coming and now on to our dinosaur of the day lusotitan which was a request by portuguese eagle via youtube so thanks lusotitan was a sauropod that lived in the late jurassic in what is now portugal and the name means lusitania titan the name luso refers to an inhabitant of lusitania quote an ancient region that partly corresponds to portugal end quote the type species is Lusotitan ataliensis, and the species name refers to the site where it was found, Atalie. Lusotitan was found in the Lorinha Formation in 1947. Manuel de Matos, who was part of the Geological Survey of Portugal, found large sauropod fossils there. And then in 1957, Albert Felix de la Parent and George Zishevsky named those fossils Brachiosaurus ataliensis. So it's a synonym to Brachiosaurus italiensis. Lusotitan is considered to be a brachiosaurid because of its low neural spines and elongated humerus and long forelimbs and other features, though the skull is not known, but the skull probably is similar to other brachiosaurid skulls. In 2003, Octavio Mateus and Miguel Teles Antunes renamed it as a separate genus, Lusotitan. De La Parent did not assign a holotype, so in 2003, Mateus chose the skeleton as the lectotype and they chose the most complete individual to be the lectotype. Mannion and others re-described the Lusotitan lectotype in 2013. Fossils found include a partial skeleton, no skull, and individual vertebrae found in a few locations. The Lorinha Formation was a coastal region with similar plants and animals as the Morrison Formation in the U.S. and the Tendaguru Formation in Tanzania. Lusotitan is the largest known dinosaur from its habitat. It was about 82 feet or 25 meters long. Other dinosaurs that lived in the area include theropods, Allosaurus, Ceratosaurus, Laurenhanosaurus, Torvosaurus, the Ankylosaur, Dracopelta, Diplodocid sauropods, Supersaurus, Laurenhanosaurus, ZB, and Stegosaurus, Centrosaurus, and Miragaya. And our fun fact for the day is that Charles Sternberg, who's featured in that Bone Wars game, and then I realized I didn't know nearly as much about him as Othniel Charles Marsh or Edward Drinker Cope, really had a better life than the two of them, maybe because he wasn't so full of resentment and hatred. <laughs> so, That's a nice way to put it. <laughs> unlike Cope and Marsh, who died when they were in their 50s and 60s, respectively, Charles Sternberg lived until his 90s. And that's pretty good for someone born in the mid-1800s. That's pretty good even for now. Yeah. 
He lived until the 1940s, which is pretty crazy. I'm not sure exactly when, because one site said 1943 and the other said 1948, which would make him either 93 or 98 when he died. But either way, that's pretty impressive. He did lose two children when they were young, but his three surviving sons all pursued vertebrate paleontology as adults. And with those sons, he also discovered a mummy hadrosaur in the early 1900s after Cope and Marsh were gone. So good for him. The moral of the story is be a happy person. (laughs) Don't let anger consume you. And on that note, that (laughs) wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. And again, if you want to join our growing community, check out our page at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again. And until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.